God takes such a person like that down in the dumps, does not even know how to go about it, how to make his way to the top. He knows that he must be in the top. He's down. That's why he's unhappy, troubled, in despair. And God calls him to repent. That means come again to the top. And he can come again to the top through what Jesus has done for him. Amen? Verse 35, you shall do no justice in judgment, in measurement of length, weight, and volume. I guess these problems started way back then. They started cheating on measurement of length, weight, and volume. You shall have honest scales, honest weights, honest epha, and honest hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This time the whole thing is there, see? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. In other words, let your business practices be honest. Do that which is right, he says. Don't be cheating, don't be, you know, doing all these things. Uh, it, was, it is another kind of oppression, you see. Where you cheat another man and gain for yourself. That, that is another kind of covert oppression. God says, you've been oppressed, you've been taken advantage of, you had suffered at the hands of Egyptians, they took you for a ride, they did anything and everything they wanted and justified it. Don't do that to others. You were oppressed, so don't oppress others with this kind of oppression, he says. So, again, God is giving laws about economic life. Now turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 15. Verse 1, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. Every, seven, every seventh year was to be a year of release. They called it a year of release. Every man who owed money shall be released from his debts. This is a program that God had. Why that program? Why every seven years are released from the debts? Because... Otherwise, some of these, the borrowers are mainly the poor, the poor borrowers. 
They don't have, so they borrow. And uh, every, seven year, every seventh year was a year of release because if the debt went on for years and years and years, they will drown in their debts. Because I'm sure they charged a lot of interest, probably worse than what it is today. And so God knew that if it went on for years and years and years, they will not survive. So God said, every seven years, let's have it as a debt release year. Start all over again. Forgive the man of his debts, he says. Verse 2, this is the form of release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbor nor his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. Why is he doing this? Why should the debt be forgiven every seven years? See, God is trying to get everyone to enter into the promised land, everyone to enjoy the milk and honey, everyone to come into the condition that he originally designed for them, everyone to have prosperity, everyone to be blessed, everyone to have everything that they need, that nobody should be overly burdened with uh, all kinds of obligations. So he says, it's called the Lord's release. <laughs> Of a foreigner you may require it, but you shall give, you shall give up your claim to what is owed by your brother. Among the Israelites, they should not want the debt back. They should give up. If it's their brother, they should give up. You know, there are more uh, Jews that live in uh, New York City than in the whole of Israel. At least it used to be back some 20 years ago. More Jews in the city of New York than in Israel. And a lot of them came during the Holocaust and the trouble the period. And those that were already there and settled there had some associations. They say that as soon as some new people landed without anything, they would take them in and they will look at their skills and abilities and whatever they are interested in. They will help them with a loan to start a little business uh, and help them until they came up and uh, like this, so many Jews prospered there. They say in New York City, if you made a hundred dollars, ninety-nine of it will go to a Jew. Because you went to pay, bought a paper, it's a Jewish shop. You went to a dentist, he's a Jew. You had a heart operation, he's a Jew. Doctor is a Jew. And uh, you went anywhere, bought anything, you bought a pair of uh, pants, uh, you're probably buying it from a Jew. Everywhere there was Jews, and they were really doing well. And all of them, you know, they followed this principle in their times of trouble because they knew that God does not want any of them to be poor. And they are the richest community, highest earning community in America today, they say. <laughs> because they follow these kinds of laws that were given to them. Economic life is based on God's word and God's laws. Of a foreigner you may require it, but you shall give up your claim to what is owed by your brother, except when there, be, when there may be no poor among you, for the Lord will greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance. In English it didn't come out so well. But what it is saying is, if it's a foreigner you may require whatever you loaned him, you may ask him, but not from an Israelite, because these are God's people. He wants to show, through blessing these people to the rest of the world, He wants to show how blessed they are, so that the rest of the world may, may be drawn to God. So He says, if it's your brother, don't ask what is owed, forgive, forgive him. And then in verse 4 is the confusion. Verse 4 literally is saying, you know what? It is saying, do this because I do not want anyone to be poor among you. If you read some other translation, it will come out very well. I want you to do this. I want you to have a once in seven year forgiveness of all debts because there shall not be any poor among you. One translation translates it exactly like that. There shall not be poor among you. And the Lord will bless you in the land which your Lord God is giving you to possess as an inheritance. So, what is God doing? God is saying, there shall not be any poor among you. I think you should write it and put it somewhere in your house. So you can look at it every day. There shall not be any poor among you. 
that is the will of god you want to know god's heart god's heart says i don't want even one person to be poor not even one person to be poor that is not my will because in chapter 1 and 2 of genesis is shown already what the paradigm is for earthly human life it's abundance and delight in abundance that's the way man should live there shall not be any poor among you god says if you follow my principles and promote my policy if you'll work towards this if you don't allow anybody to become poor in your community if you will do your you live your economic life in this way there will not be any poor among you you follow what i'm telling you there will not be any poor among you he says <laughs> then i'll bless you greatly in the land that you will possess for an inheritance and verse 5 only if you carefully obey the voice of the lord your god to observe with care all these commandments which i command you today this will happen only if you carefully observe these things he says for the lord your god will bless you as he promised you you shall lend to many nations but you shall not borrow you shall reign over many nations but they shall not reign over you why should you be blessed why is blessing so important now these people are not asking so much of blessing but god is insisting that he blesses them god says i'll bless you i'll bless you it is god who's saying you shall not borrow but you shall lend to many nations they never said lord i don't want to borrow i want to lend no that concept itself comes from god god is saying you shall not borrow i don't want you to be borrowers i want you to be lenders i'll bless you he says you know why god wants to bless them because god wants them to have much more than enough so that they can give a helping hand to others who may be in need that is why god wants to bless them you you'll be blessed and be a blessing god said to abraham that's the purpose always verse 7 if there is among is if there is among you a poor man of your brethren that is if there is another israelite who is poor among you within any gates in your land which the lord your god is giving you you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother but you shall open your hand wide to him willingly lend him sufficient for his need whatever he needs see that's why prosperity is important you should be prosperous otherwise you'll be saying well i myself don't have anything what can i give you you should be prosperous because when someone comes with need you will be able to then say well i can just give you that no problem you don't have to give it back to me i'll just give it to you and help you in this time of your need here it is that is why prosperity is needed many christians don't understand it and they knock prosperity they say well what is this you know this is not spiritual it is very spiritual god wants us not to be borrowers but be lenders god wants us to be people who will give and uh, and not need and want verse 9 beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart saying the seventh year the year of release is at hand and your eye be evil against your poor brother and give him nothing and he cry out to the lord against you and it shall become sin to you sin among you well, you know what he's saying he says he understands human nature very well because seventh year is a year of forgiveness suppose a guy comes at the end of the 6th year in 2 months 7th year is going to come nobody wants to lend him anything he comes here and this fellow is running this way because he doesn't want to lend him any money because 7th year is very near if the guy borrows now he may not come back with the money he does not want to lend him he says don't think like that he says it will be a sin you shall surely give to him and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him see how well god understands human nature don't give him being grieved in your heart you know how some people are they'll give you and as you go they'll be like oh gone 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 there it goes i'll never see it again <laughs> god says give but don't grieve over it give gladly he says for this thing because of your giving the lord your god will bless you in all your works and all to which you put your hand this is absolutely true you know when you do this god's blessing will come upon the work of your hand you will have so much joy because so much is coming to you 
you will have no time to grieve over what is gone, you know. Some people sit down and calculate, I have so much outstanding, so much, if, so much of it, this man owes me this much, that man owes me that much and so on. Well, when the Lord your God blesses you abundantly, that will not matter. <laughs> that will look like peanuts, you know. You won't even, you'll forget, you just won't think about it, you'll say, well, forget it, you know. Let the guy have it, it's all right, because you are blessed so much. Eh? This is the way God puts it. Now look at verse 11, for the poor will never cease from the land. In verse 4 he says, there shall not be any poor among you. He says exactly the opposite here. After saying, he shall, there shall not be any poor among you, that's what I want. You follow these laws because there shall not be any poor among you if you follow these laws. That's what he says in 4. Verse 11, just few verses later he says, the poor will never cease from you. Jesus even quotes that. He says, the poor shall always be with you. Why? Because we live in an imperfect world, there will always be poor. These laws will not be perfectly followed, so there will be, always be people left behind the prosperity ladder. <laughs> there will always be people not cared for. Why? Because not everybody is going to obey God's law. God knew that even He instituted these laws, that human nature is such that it is not a nature to give, it is always a nature to receive. So many people will take that route and will not do what God has said, and therefore the poor will always be among them. So God says the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore, He says, I know poor will always be there because you're not going to perfectly follow, uh, follow this. He says, so you open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. The fact that poor will always be there makes it even more important that you open your hand to the poor. Now, why I read this whole thing is to convey this thing, the heart of God. Look at the economic life, the laws concerning economic life. It's very clear that God wants to raise people from the lowly condition they're in and raise them up and bring them up. There's no doubt in my mind about that. God wants to bring them up. He does not desire poverty for them. He does not want to leave them there. That's why he tells you and I to pick them up and give them a boost. Give them a little help. Help them up the ladder a little bit because God wants them to join you. <laughs> the man down there to join you. That is why in the blessing that he pronounced upon the people of Israel, he said, you shall not be beneath but you shall be above only. Very important. God doesn't want you to be just above, but above only. That's the only place where you stay. Never come down. You know why these laws? Because He didn't want the people to go into the promised land and the land of milk and honey and then become poor due to some circumstances. He always wanted to protect the people from falling off that prosperity life down below into the dumps. He always wants to protect their interests, protect the poor, protect the vulnerable, protect those people that may be taken advantage of. So he says, you shall always be above, never beneath. You shall be the head and not the tail. Always be above. In the beginning, he put them right on top. One, word, one way to translate it, you shall not be beneath, you shall be on top. I like that better because it's more simpler English. In the beginning, in Genesis 1 and 2, God put man right at the top. And always, you will find in the story of redemption throughout the Bible, whether it's people of Israel coming out of Egypt or any other incident, you will see that God is always trying to bring them back to the top. Because God knows that the place for man is only at the top. When Jesus came preaching, Mark chapter 1 verse 15 says, he came preaching, saying, the kingdom of God is here. Repent, for the kingdom of God is here. That's what Jesus came preaching. Now, you know the, what the word repent means. The repent means to turn around, literally. From the Greek, the word means to turn around. That means you're going this way. All of a sudden, you're convicted. You know you are wrong. The way you're going is not right. Therefore, you turn around and go exactly the opposite way. 
That's what repent is, to turn around. That's from the Greek. But let's consider the English word itself. It's very interesting. Repent is made of two words, re and pent. Re means again, right? And pent is top. That's why the apartment right on the top of the building is called penthouse. Why? Because it's right on top, right? So when Jesus came, he said, repent. That means he was going around calling people who are down in the dumps, lost all their happiness, lost all their joy, and are living a dissatisfied life, worried and fear, and absolutely troubled, unhappy, frustrated, in turmoil, confused, going around as sheep without shepherd, carrying the burdens of this life, burdened down with every kind of problem, including economic problems. He comes and says to them, repent. That means, hey, you at the bottom, you, you who have gone all the way to the bottom, I'm telling you, repent. That means come again, back up to the top. Because the kingdom of God is here. God has sent salvation to you. God has sent a savior to you. God has sent a way for you to get out of that mess and get back on the top again so that you have dominion over everything and not be dominated by everything. That's the whole point of salva salvation. That's the whole point of the Bible, basically. That's what gospel is. The gospel... The gospel is not just about man just getting saved and going to heaven one day when he dies. No. It's man who's in the dumps because he has lost contact with God, confidence in life. He's a failure. He's not happy. He doesn't know how to live his life. He's in chaos, emptiness, and darkness. He needs to be recreated again. That's why Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. All things have become new. God takes such a person like that down in the dumps, does not even know how to go about it, how to make his way to the top. He knows that he must be in the top. He's down. That's why he's unhappy, troubled, in despair. And God calls him to repent. That means come again to the top. And he can come again to the top through what Jesus has done for him. Amen? That's the gospel. That is the gospel. And that's exactly what God is trying to do in the incidents where he brings the people of Israel out of Egypt. He brings them to the top and he wants them to stay at the top. And all the laws have to do with staying at the top securely and not losing your position. All the laws having to do with protection, protecting from failure and disaster. So you stay right at the top. Amen? Your place is at the top. Are you convinced? <laughs> Write it up somewhere in your house. Put it somewhere where you get up and first thing you see is that your place is right at the top. You shall have dominion. Amen? Thanks be to God who always name. Thanks be to God who always causes us to win. Yeah. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in His name. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We have overcome. Hallelujah. Oh, 
You're the 